Hello, everyone. We're here today with another professional athlete who is from my hometown of Winchester, Virginia. This individual had a standout career at Winthrop University playing soccer and even spent some time in the Major League Soccer after being selected by the New York Red Bulls in the 2008 MLS draft. With that being said, please help me in welcoming Johnny Gilkerson. How you doing, bro? What's up, man? Hey, I appreciate you joining. Looking forward to hearing your story. I think there's a lot of things you can definitely share that's going to definitely help influence kids that's trying to follow the footsteps you took as being a professional soccer player. Yeah, man, I appreciate you having me. I think it's a dope concept. I'm glad to be a part of it. Absolutely. So, hey, man, I actually knew you from high school. You had a few years ahead of me, but um, being from Winchester, it's a small circle. You played basketball, you played soccer, you even played football your senior year, if I'm not mistaken. Um, honestly, I always thought of you as a basketball player, but I knew you are a terrific soccer player. So how did you kind of pick that lane of soccer to be that sport that you're going to follow with and play professionally? How did that all come about? I mean, I had an opportunity to play all of them in college, but if you look at the sheer numbers of things when it comes to like basketball versus soccer, it's, uh, basketball is typically going to have about a 15-man roster and only five guys that you know are going to be on the floor at a given time, where Soccer is 11, and you can have up to 30, 35 guys. So I felt like, you know, you, you have a better chance and your odds are better choosing soccer. When I, I mean, I felt like I was probably a better basketball player, but uh, I, I had, a, you know, decent offers to go play both. And I was, like, kind of getting burnt out with basketball. And, you know, I had kind of tapered off in high school and only playing during the high school season instead of playing select ball. So I was still kind of fresh with soccer and I wanted to explore that. And I had a good opportunity down at Winthrop uh, with a coach that had a good relationship with Coach Carden. And so when I went down and fell in love with the campus, that that was like the icing on the cake for me. And, you know, with the about 10 months a year, good weather. So I was like, you know, it's a good right. I always thought of you as a basketball player just because I think I followed it more. You probably don't know this, but I actually looked up to you, man. Like growing up, when I used to go to high school games, I'd be on the bleachers. I was a point guard myself, as you probably remember. So you're someone I really try to idolize, even though I never played to the level you did. But just curiosity, what other schools are looking at you for soccer? What schools are looking at you for, like, basketball and football? Man, you get me on the spot with that one. I don't even really remember. I know, like, American had expressed some interest in me in basketball. Uh, right when I signed my letter of intent to go to Winthrop, I remember JMU getting on the line, and I was like, pretty much like it's pretty much a done deal. I'd already signed, and I didn't want to renege on it. At, you know, after having put them on hold anyway by, you know, electing to play football my last year. Um, because uh, before I decided to actually play football, I was supposed to go down to a camp in the summertime for Winthrop, but I elected to skip that because I was jumping into football. So right. they were on hold, and I guess they thought I wasn't going to come. And then it, it wasn't until, I think, January or February of, you know, my senior year where I decided that I was actually going to go down to Winthrop and play. Um, but you're talking 16 years ago now, man. I don't even, that, those are the only things that I can really remember. <laughs> There's too many of them, huh? There's a lot of options. But I, I will say that at all levels, from D3 all the way down to D1, I had authors and they were sending it to my house every day. And I, I do remember it being like a really, really rough time. Some people might think like, well, why would it be a rough time when you have all this opportunity? But as a 17, 18 year old kid and you've got all these school's looking at you and you, you really don't want to let anyone down. And at the end of the day, it is your decision, but like you feel, you feel the pressure and weight of coaches constantly, you know, asking you what you're going to do. And, you know, at 17, 18, you really don't know what to do and what will be the right decision. Uh, you know, I, I felt like, I'm like, man, why am I like stressing over this? But like, at the end of the day, like it was my future and like you wanted to make the right decision. And, right. You know, I knew at the end of the day, I felt like I made that decision. And if I had to do it over again, I would definitely have chosen one to the university. Um, especially based, based on the size of the school, the population, and then like small town environment, you know, kind of mirroring what Winchester has to offer. And then also playing at the division one level at a really competitive conference. So I, I thought it was pretty dope to be able to have that opportunity to go down there. Uh, and and right. I appreciate them for you know, taking me on. Yeah, I think it's amazing because, I mean, some people are just lucky to have options in one sport. But like you said, across basketball, football, and soccer, you kind of had your options available. Were there some things that you kind of kept in mind throughout high school that kept you motivated that was like, you know what, an effort to play at this level, these are some things I need to do mentally, physically. Could you maybe share some of that? 
So, yeah, I mean, definitely as a kid, you, you know, you just play because it's fun and that's what you want to do. But, like, my competitive level has always been there, man. I, I don't know where it comes from, but I don't like to lose at anything. And so right. as a small kid, it was always in the back of my mind that that was what I wanted to do when I, right. you know, when I was, you know, eligible and able to do it. And so I can remember, you know, I started playing in around eight and I was always like, yeah, that's going to be me. When I'm looking at the guys on TV, I'm like, yeah, I can't wait. That's going to be me. That's going to be me. But, you know, the the grind starts at, at that age, you know, like I, I don't advocate for parent, or parents pushing their kids, you know, who, who don't want it. I feel like a lot of kids that do have it um, have that mentality already as a kid. And yeah, you know, you can kind of develop into that as you get older, but I felt like I always had that and that was always my goal and I was willing to do whatever it takes uh, or whatever right. to get to that level. So um, I can remember, you know, back in like fifth grade, like every day after school, I would take my, my ball and my, and my backpack and yeah, I would play at recess, but like me and I don't know if you remember John Dorn, but we would leave yep. school and go down to Hanley and play every single day after school at fifth grade. You know, his mom was a health teacher at, at yep. Hanley. So I would just hang out there and we would play one-on-one -on -one and do all kinds of crazy stuff and then just sit and like talk like, because both of us, that was a dream of both of ours. And it was like every day, like whether it was cold, right. raining, a lot, like him and I were out there on, on the field playing soccer. I think you kind of touched on there. Um, it's always nice to have some type of support. I think John Dorn, like you said, having someone that actually has the same aspiration always helps. And then, like you said, just being persistent, doing something every day. So like what people say, if you want to do something, the more you do it, the better you will be. And uh, you got to have fun doing it. So definitely where you're coming from. Talking about Winthrop, you said you had a relationship down there with the coach. You fell in love with the campus. It's um, about an hour south of Charlotte, uh, which is definitely better weather than where we're from. But how was that experience um, playing soccer down there? So, yeah, I'll, I'll touch on a little bit, too, with the, the connection. So if you remember Coach Carden, uh, with the head coach at Hanley, he developed a relationship with taking his team down to Winthrop. And he had sent players down there previously um, with, like, Mark Peters um, as a goalkeeper down there and some other guys that I can't really remember right now. But um, that, that's where it started. And, and, you know, having him develop that relationship and that, that trust from Coach having sent him, you know, quality player, uh, players in the past, he came up in my sophomore, junior and took a look at me a couple of times and, and then, you know, expressed interest in me. And then I took a visit down there. Um, and then from, from jump, I, when I, once I got down there, man, I was like, this is it. Like, right. this is where I want to be. Um, and then, you know, you rewind probably, I think I was maybe 12 or so. Um, my travel team actually went to camp, uh, to camp at winter. So it was like, you know, full circle when I went down there again at like 17, 18, mm -hmm. um, you know, obviously a little bit more experience I ended up being able to see the world a little bit different. And I was like, you know, this, this is it, man. This is where I'm going. So that's kind of how it developed. And it was more than just like a, you know, a player coach relationship. You know, Coach uh, Pospenko was like another father to me when I was away from home. And he filled, mm -hmm. he filled that void of when I left, you know, I guess you would say the nest with Coach Carter and, and kind of took over in that role for me. So it, it was a blessing, man, to have, you know, people like that around you to, to be that support cast, also, you know, pushing you forward to be better. That's awesome. I think that definitely talks about relationships. That's always important. And you never know how you pass across. Like you say, you're talking about time from 12, 13 years old to going 17, 18 years old, how the circle just kind of comes together. That's why relationship building is the most important things. Um, sports and business, uh, you can be great and everything, but sometimes it helps knowing people. I mean, you hear that all the time. That's how people bring recruits. It's like they know some, someone since they're a youth, and now it's, it's how they bring them in. So I think it's very important for coaches and players. In regards to playing there, you had a great career. Can you talk about your experience your freshman year and talk about, like, the work that you put in to get to where you were to end up getting drafted by the New York Red Bulls? Yeah, so when I was recruited for, uh, by Winthrop to come down there, I was actually recruited as a defender. So going into my senior season at Hanley, Coach pulled me inside and was like, hey, look, they're looking at you to move to defender. So would you be okay, you know, moving to the position now to try to give me some experience before going down there? And I'm like, yeah, whatever, you know, like, you put me in goalie, like, that's fine. As long as I'm yeah. on the field, like, that's all I care about. I just want to be on the field and I want to win. That's, you know, whatever. Um, and, it, and it worked out anyway. We had, a, you know, a bunch of quality players in uh, Hamley, too, to, to fill the place that, uh, the position that I used to play. So, yeah, so I moved back to left back and spent there – well, most of the season as a left back until, you know, I moved around a lot. But going into winter season, I was started playing as a left back. 
And then we had some injuries and coach had known that I had played forward before. So I went straight from playing left back to starting as a forward uh, my freshman year with, with uh, Winthrop. Um, so I spent probably the whole year playing between left mid and forward um, for Winthrop. And then in the spring, they were like, you know what? Uh, we need some speed in the back. So they put me uh, at center back uh, next to one of our experienced uh, players, Dottie Gary. And so I was able to learn playing center back from him in his senior season. Um, and, and then moving on to my junior season, I, you know, I was pretty solidified as a, as a, as a center back. Um, and then uh, I think it was my sophomore junior season. I can't really remember. But in the summer, uh, I didn't come home. I went ahead and moved down to Virginia Beach and stayed and played uh, PDL, which is a professional development league uh, that most college players at the D1 level, I guess, I guess not really even D1, but we have some players that were D2, D3, but it's it's probably like the, the perennial, at the time, the perennial league for, for college kids to play in the summertime. Um, it's kind of like the, uh, the wooden bat league, if, you, if you're familiar with that. So it's, it's You train in a professional environment, but you don't get paid, but it's but you it gets you ready it. for it. it gets it you ready. ready. For it. it gets you ready for the fall season. Yeah. So right. I, I went down there. I guess maybe that was my sophomore year in 06. and then I went back and I, I I was playing with players that were you know way better than me. So it was it was pretty tough in the summertime. I was playing a lot of guys at OU and UVA. You know, playing you know against guys that you know played competitive ball in the ACC. So it was it was great for my my development. Um, and I definitely would recommend. Uh, kids doing that in the college level, keeping keeping busy in the summertime um, and not just going home and then training because you, you're going to play 20 or so games in the summertime and then go right back into your, your fall season. So I went back. I was already in shape, already ready to go. The ball was at my feet again for probably about 11 months out of the year at that time. Um, and then we roll right into that that junior year where, you know, I'm solidified as the center back. And then we, we make it to the – to the conference final losing overtime. So, I mean, that hurt bad, man. Like, it hurt so bad that uh, I can still remember standing on the sideline, watching them celebrate, watching them hoist the trophy, because I was like, I've got another year, and I'm going to make sure that that's our team doing that. So we left that season um, with a bad taste in our mouth, but, you know, the commitment next year for everyone was completely different, man. There was guys that were, you know, living on the West Coast that didn't go home that the next summer either. They stayed at the campus working with the strength training coaches over the summer, um, getting jobs so they can support themselves to, to, to be able to stay at the school. And then I went back again. The name had changed, uh, but I went back again to Hampton Roads down at Virginia Beach uh, and played my second season. It was like night and day having had that experience the year before. You go from probably being probably one of the weakest guys on the team to to probably one of the, the best on the team at, and, and as well in a leadership role. And it was even, even better because – a couple of guys that played on my team, they followed me up to, to Hampton Roads this year. So it was cool having that little nucleus from one to take up to, to Hampton Roads to play with um, Hampton Roads Prime under uh, uh, Coach John Hall, which was a really good experience too, because, you know, he taught me some things, you know, you, you grow up thinking like uh, the team, the team, the team, and he would always be like, you know, F the team, man. You can't be a team without winning your own individual battles. And that, that's what stuck with me um, the most, uh, in terms of, you know, really understanding what, what he meant by that, right? Yeah, obviously the team matters, but, like, you don't really have a team unless you can win your individual battles on the field. And, and if everyone handles their individual battles, and then that's what propels the team to be successful. So that's probably one of the biggest biggest moments that I, I still remember. And you can – I still use that today in my life, you know, even in, in the working environment. Yeah. But, but uh, so going back into, I guess, yeah, that's the junior year that – so going into that season, again, coming in, already in shape. Uh, have been playing with a couple guys that, you know, followed me there to, to play. Uh, we go back in, rolling in. And it, it, like I said, we, we hit them like a like a, a wild storm, man. Like we were picked number one in the preseason. We won the regular season, won the conference tournament, got that at-large bid to, to go and play in the NCAA tournament. We ended up falling short, uh, losing uh, to ODU, which was crazy because a lot of the guys that were – at ODU, I had played with in the summertime, so it was like a, a blessing, but like a curse. And a blessing. Like you're playing against dudes you know, but like, you know, you they, know, know, you, they know your moves, you know their moves. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. so yeah. They kind of had like a scouting report on a lot of us. I had it on them too, but like, it, it was just weird. Like, damn, like this is full circle again. 
Mm -hmm. Coming back to play against some dudes that you, you know, have played with for the past two seasons in the summer. Right. <laughs> then, uh, I guess moving into my senior year, we fell a little short. I guess we kind of got a little complacent because we actually hosted the tournament that year. Um, and we faced a, a really tough Liberty team that had some you know, pretty good talent that were hungry. Um, so they ended up knocking us off and I think the semifinals. Um, and then they, I think they lost to Radford or something like that in the final, uh, who we actually destroyed during the season. But, um, and then, again, it wasn't over for me. So throughout that whole process, like in the back of my mind, I was like, you know, I'm still wanting to pursue it as a, as a career. And so there was, no, there was never an off season, you know. When the season's over, that's when your next season begins. So you, you start hitting the gym again and doing individual workouts. And and the spring season in soccer, man, it's 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 a lot more dedication than actual during the season because you you can train a lot more and you don't have to worry about you know tapering off for games throughout the week. So that's where a lot of the work gets done. Um, we we will probably end in November and we're already back on the field and in the gym by by January or so. Um, and so again, you know, putting in the work again and you know, some coaches started expressing interest because my coach would be like, you know, I got on the phone with such and such. And, and that's when the pressure starts building again because then you know, like, people are watching you and it's like, you got to always be at your best, which you should be anyway. But that extra pressure, right? Like, you know, some people can probably fold on it, but I kind of thrive on that, yeah. that pressure because it, it gives you something to, something tangible to like strive for. Mm -hmm. So uh, after, you know, losing that final, I go right into training again, and then I get an invitation to go to the, the Info Sports Combine down in Florida. And so on Christmas break, uh, my mom and I drove all the way from Winchester down to, to Florida for the Combine. We actually- Oh, wow. Yeah, we drove through the night, man, and got down there probably like three or four in the morning. Uh, first day of camp started that morning. So I barely got into the hotel and maybe slept like, two or three hours before I had to get up to go, you know, register to go, you know, start the, the combine and whatnot. But it, it was crazy, man. Like I was so dedicated to sleep, it didn't even matter. Like I was just so excited to be down there and be with a bunch of, you know, quality Absolutely. players and, 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 and see what happened. So, you know, and, and that being said, like, you know, all the coaches that were down there from all the different levels uh, was also a good experience too. And then, you know, I, I was I was satisfied that if I didn't get picked up, it was cool that I still got to do that experience. And then, you know, lo and behold, the you know the draft happens, and you know you, I don't make it through the super or the super draft, which is maybe three rounds or so. And so you know I went on about my business, and then I went for a workout anyway because I still thought I would be able to like you know get a tryout somewhere and, and, and go and walk on. And then I get a phone call from from Jeff Vegas, one of the one of the goats, man, and in, in, in terms of MLS playing and also playing for the national team, he was the the sporting director at the time for for the Red Bull. And so I get this call, and I'm like, yeah, all right, whatever, you know. I'm thinking like, this isn't real, man. Like somebody's playing a trick on me, right? Like, right. And then literally, I call my my boy who also got drafted by the uh, New England Revolution on my team, sorry, I think. And he's like, hey, man, did you get the call? And so I check my phone, and I'm like, all right, I got this message. I'm like, yeah, somebody's playing. <laughs> so really like like right after I checked the message, one of the like player reps like called me and was like, Hey, you know, we need you. Uh you just got drafted. Congratulations. We need you on the plane this weekend. And I'm thinking like, what? This weekend? Like this is Thursday. They need me to fly up Saturday. So <laughs> two days to like withdraw from class, get all my stuff packed up, and literally live out of a bag for one bag for like three or four months at a hotel in, in New York, man. It's crazy. Like it's like you couldn't even put this in a book of how it happened for me, but but I wouldn't change it for the world. That's awesome, man. That just shows you always just need to be ready. You don't know where your opportunities are to come. Just put that hard work in, build those relationships, and things work out. One something that stuck out to me, and I think you can attest to that too, is what your coach has said that. You know, sometimes don't think about the team so much. If you worry about yourself as individuals, if every single person takes care of themselves on and off the field, has to worry about what they need to focus on, collectively, that will all come together. Uh, I think a lot of times as coaches, they'll get on you if you're thinking about yourself. But I think that's a good way of putting it. Sometimes it's not a bad thing. So I really like that. Yeah. In regards to um, the combine, did you have an idea that you'd get drafted prior to that? Or do you think that really helped? Um, your stock to get drafted? I 100% agree that that definitely helped. Like, I probably was on somebody's radar, maybe on the bottom of the list, but mm -hmm. you know, when you put, you know, 
the picture to their name to somebody's face like it, it, it's able it's, other than outside of seeing you in college or on film like they can really see you in camp see you train in a professional environment and then make their own assessment on you versus being told word of mouth from a coach that this is a good kid because right like how many right. people will say that this is a good kid and then it may not pan out but being that I was able to go down to that camp train under their supervision um, in that closed environment I think that's what um, was able to set me up and put me on somebody's radar to, for them to take a gamble on me um, because you're, you're you go through a camp down there and then at the end of each day you kind of play like full full games and so they can fully assess you and then by the end of the week they'll pick like the best out of whatever group that you're put into and put them into like an all-star game so I was able to make the all-star game on on the Sunday and then that's when you're really on like the, the center stage in front of everybody being able to showcase what you can do. And so I think that's probably where it happened because it's crazy that the guys that were on my team in the All-Star game, mm -hmm. three, of them, three of them actually ended up um, getting drafted by um, New Rebels in the supplemental draft as well. So it was, it was kind of crazy, right, to see them in Florida and then right. turn around and two to three weeks later see them again in, in the rookie camp at, at uh, Red Bull. It's a small world out here. You know, everyone crosses paths, especially professionally, any type of business. You kind of come across some people. That's your niche, and that's what you kind of follow. When do you think about your most memorable experience? I'm sure there's a lot. I'm sure um, the combine was very exciting, especially having all that adrenaline driving down from Winchester down there, being drafted. Like you said, you're like someone's playing with me, so well, probably your first day there. But what was probably your most memorable experience? or at least one of the ones that really pops out when you think about your time? I would be, be the final, man. Uh, I was just fortunate enough to be on a team that, like, we were kind of mediocre throughout the, the whole year. But, you know, in, in any professional sport, the team that gets hot is probably going to be the team that will, will go and see it to its end. And, and that's what, what's happened with us is, like, you know, we were hanging on, hanging on, tying a lot of games. And then, you know, lo and behold, we're like, damn, like, we, we got a chance to make it. And, we were, the way it was structured back then is, is we were in the Eastern Conference, but mm -hmm. the way the points worked out, we ended up playing in the playoffs in the Western Conference, it ended up being Western Conference champ finals my rookie year. And being out in LA, you know, playing uh, in, in, the, in the Galaxy Stadium against the crew was probably probably the best thing that you could ever imagine, right? Like it's one thing to, to, to be a fan and watch it on TV or even be a fan and be in the stands and then to be out there through that whole week of, you know, it's pretty much like a party leading up to the, you know, the MLS final. And, and so there's, a, you know, a bunch of people around. There's a lot of buzz going on, a lot of media around, mm -hmm. a lot of players that play in the city that are around coming by that know people. And so that was probably the, the biggest thing that I'll remember the most is, is as a young player being involved in that um, environment, training and preparing those guys for the final, and then also being on the sideline at the final, you know, with a sold out stadium playing on national television. So, <laughs> you know that's like, awesome yeah you, you, you can't even dream of that man like it's it's crazy to have had that experience as your first you know year in the league absolutely I'm sure you know transition from college to professionally so wise everyone's playing at that level right in college you're probably like the number one guy uh, you're definitely up there but once you get to the professional level everyone's playing at that level aside from skill wise what was the biggest transition from you from winter to to professional so even I'll even say if you go back as far as high school, man, uh, the, the technical side, right? Even, you know, everybody thinks that they're technical until you get to the next level and then you see how technical it gets. Like, I, I was obviously a good athlete, um, but probably was a little bit behind technically because, you know, I only played three months out of the year, so I wasn't getting the touches that I should have been getting, being that I played other sports. So going into the college game, right, it's, it's a, to see things happen before they actually happen is, is what – sets, you know, the, the, the decent players away from those that are just mediocre is being able to have what the picture in your mind and also translate into the field because the moment you look up and you look down, the, the picture in the game has changed. So I felt like that was probably one of the biggest challenges is 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 being able to, to see things happen before they do happen and also be able to have the game slow down so that you can see multiple, uh, multiple scenarios develop before they do. So... Um, but I think what helped me is coming from a system where you're not going to be, you know, a dribbling player and you're not going to be running all over the field doing it yourself. I came from a system where everyone shared the ball. So playing one, two, and three touch max um, helped my speed and helped me, you know, transition into the college game. And then 
you know, you thought you were technical in college and then you, you know, you get to the professional level. And I can remember like calling coach uh, Pasapenko and being like, man, this game is so precise. Like, you know, the, the littlest thing will throw off a, a training session in, in a professional environment if it's not like, like, like fluid. Uh, and I can remember being, being that guy who the first few practices or maybe in the first few months of practice, being the guy who was the one throwing off um, the flow of practice because <laughs> the technical level is so high and right. so precise that, you know, the, like the, the most minute thing will throw off something. And, and I, I just remember calling Tim like, man, like, I don't even know if I'm ready for this because it's so like, <laughs> And he was like, well, what, what did you expect? You know, like, you know, you're playing with the guys that are the best of the best. And, right. and so you, know, you put up or shut up. And like, that's one thing here across all sports. You know, everyone's gifted, but once you get to that level, it's more about that it's understanding and being a step ahead. And I think that all comes with practice and just filmings, uh, looking at tapes. So that's something that you definitely, I think you touched on just now. Who would you say was the toughest defender? You were a defender, you played. Who was the toughest person? that you were just like, you know what, this is the hardest guy I've had to like try to just check. Uh, who, who pops out? Definitely Juan Pablo Angel, man. He is a legend in Colombia. He's a legend in MLS. He's in the record books for scoring and the record books for assists in MLS. Uh, a guy who played on the Colombian national team, played at Aston Villa in the Premier League. And even at probably the age of 36, when I was 22, the dude was still fit still looking like a stallion, still putting in the work. And even as a superstar, it's like, you know, most superstars that make it can kind of take off the pedal. But I mean, he was the leader, man, on and off the field. He's a guy that would come to practice before everyone got there and be the last one to leave cutting out the lights every single day. And his professionalism is something that I will forever remember um, because he was not only professional on the field, but off the field, good family man and somebody who took care of his body and also took care of the younger guys. You know, a lot of, um, I don't, I don't know how it is in other sports, but you can, it's a kind of a dog eat dog world and, and, and guys that are at that level um, so far away from their peers and then still to take the young guys under your wing. Uh, Cause I remember him even pulling me aside and, you know, making sure I'm eating right, uh, making sure I'm taking care of my body. And he would put me in on some of his training routines, uh, to show me the way of how it should be done. Uh, and, and then also on the field, you know, while he's out there kicking tail, you know, he's whispering stuff to you. <laughs> I should have played it while he's, while he's playing against me, man. Like pulling me aside, telling me like, oh, you know, you should have did this or should have stepped here in this way. And cool. this would have made you a little bit better. Would have made you make a better read. And it's just like, that's priceless, man. No, that's awesome. That just attests to his character. Um, but it also shows how much he really respected you as well. I don't think he would share that or they, I feel like when coaches or people kind of get on you and share some things they do, it's because they really believe in you and they just want to get you, you know, to, to that next level. So that, that's yeah. a good memory. Yeah, even, <laughs> I think it's something that I, I, I later learned to appreciate more too, is that, you know, you're only as good as your, your, your weakest player on the team. And so I think he understood that more. So it's like, we're only right. going to go as far as our most inexperienced player. And so mm -hmm. why not drop those nuggets that he's learned playing the game? Yep. Probably. 15 or 16 years before I even got to that level, right? So right. to shed that light on, on our, us young guys was, was, you know, like I said, pricey. That's awesome. To me, that when I think of, like, any other sports, being a huge basketball fan, that's not like a Kobe Bryant to me. You know, someone that's just going to tear you up, but at the same time, it's going to try to get you to that next level. And that's what I think what Kobe was known for. So um, I think that's what makes them great, like you said, not only on the field, but what they do out off the field and off the court. Uh, when you think about American soccer, MLS, even for myself, uh, I definitely probably don't follow it as much as you do and many others, but I definitely see the difference on how American soccer is perceived, not only within the United States, but around the world. How do you see the difference from when you played to where it's at now? It's, it's a completely different league. I, I think it, that even the world sees that the league here is one of the best leagues. Because uh, if you go back to... 2008, the, the league was still kind of suffering for attendance and ratings, but then that's about, I think, the second year that Beckham had come here. So that's where the buzz started coming when, when Beckham came to the league. They started yep. making designated players. You know, you started seeing teams um, build their own soccer-specific stadiums, which, which changes the game because then it looks like 
you know, when they're playing in the football stadiums, when they're in 65, 70,000 seat stadiums and, you know, they're not filling it out. So it looks like, you know, the tenants is suffering. So then when you get soccer specific stadiums that hold 30 and 40,000 and they're packing it out. And then as an example, you got a team like Seattle who was still playing and still does play in uh, the, Seah the Seahawks stadium, which holds 65,000 and, and they're packing that bad boy out every day since the, the inception of the team. Uh, and so you started seeing that that energy make its way across the country. Uh, again, like I said, when teams started, you know, building their own stadiums, um, the, the, the Players Association taking care of the players, making sure the league is taking care of the players. Uh, the pay has bumped up a lot for the guys. Um, and then now I think they've even moved into guys making sure that they're on like full guaranteed contracts. Because when I played, it, it wasn't like that unless you were the designated players, like, you know, like a Beckham or Juan Pablo on or you know, they're making millions of dollars and it's 100% guaranteed, you know. There were probably 15 or so guys that started the season and maybe three of us left at the, at the end of the season after some of them getting dropped off so they can pick up other players or open enough spots for international players. Um, but I think that they're much more protected. I think the attendance-wise, I know even when I was still playing that the MLS attendance was probably around fifth in the world. Um, in terms of attendance across the league. Um, and then now you, you see expansion teams coming in the league. I think they're up to probably close to 30 teams now, if not more. There's still a couple more teams building soccer-specific stadiums, trying to get that, that next expansion slot. Um, so, you know, as a league that has been here since 94, 95, um, from what it was to now look at going from like 12 teams to almost folding, and then now you're at a at competing at the level of like the NBA and NFL with 30 plus teams and almost all the teams now are starting to have their own soccer specific stadium. So I think the, the, the model worked and I think that the MLS game is only going to go up from here now because you see a lot more international players that come over here, not just the old guys that are coming to look for a nice retirement. You've got, you know, 20 some year old kids coming over here um, and, and signing those senior contracts and, and understanding that uh, the MLS is a league that's competitive on, on the world stage. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think you touched on a few people back on Wayne Rooney. You know, they're towards the tail end of their career, but I think just having them really just shares and tells everyone, hey, MLS is for real. Um, you know, it's you can come here for any any of your career, but those guys, they played for a few more years. They didn't just do like a one and done, right? So I definitely think that shed the light. But also, like you said, there's a lot of folks that's really seen how much has grown and has coming over here to actually make it a career out, out of them. So I definitely agree, man. And I think having the national teams, how well they do in the Olympics also helps too. And I think for me, that's how I kind of got gravitated. So I definitely see it growing and growing each and every year, which is awesome to see. Some fun facts. Um, who was your favorite player growing up? And did you have a player that you try to idolize? Uh, so definitely when I was probably eight, nine, 10, it was a, a guy named Marco Echeverry who played on DC United uh, from Bolivia. Uh, he, he was a center midfielder, but again, another world-class guy. I can still remember going to some of the autograph uh, sessions or even after games, he'd hang around and, and mingle with the kids. Uh, so he was probably my favorite player for the longest time. And then when I was, when I used to have, you know, the little plaits and, and braids in my hair, Kobe Jones was probably one of my favorite players growing up. Um, and then it probably transitioned because I'm an Arsenal fan. I'm, I, I fell in love with, uh, uh, Terry Henry. Uh, so, again, another world-class guy who ended up making his way to, to the States. Mm -hmm. But now, probably the, the, my favorite guy to watch is, is Messi because it's like a guy who's played at that level with other guys at the same level and he makes it look so easy. And it's like, right. you know, the, the shit isn't that easy, man. Like, and for a player <laughs> to, to make it that easy, it's like, you, you know, he's the real deal. He's, he's literally like untouchable, man. Right. Now that's a good list right there. And Messi is definitely a, a favorite for, I think, for m many people. I see it's him as kind of like a LeBron, just doing it for such a long time at that level. And it seems like they could just get better and better each year. Yeah. And you think yeah. that uh, they, they've reached their height and then they come and blow away what they did last year. And it's like, man, for a kid that, you know, left home probably around 12 or 13 to go to Barcelona and still stuck with Barcelona and, and still playing – you know, 14, 15 years at, at the top level. Mm -hmm. That goes to show you that the, the talent that he has um, yeah. not only has propelled him to be that way, but obviously he's able to take care of his body. Take himself. Yeah. Play those games, in, you know, game in and game out. 
Absolutely. Yeah, you definitely got to take care of yourself to play that long. Uh, all that wear and tear definitely add up. So I think for anyone who's, you know, whether it be soccer or any sports, it's um, you can do a lot of great things on the field, working out, doing all these drills, but you got to take care of yourself, eat well, sleep well, do all those little things that really add up. Um, that's what makes that separates from, you know, the average players to the greats like those that we just mentioned. Speaking of just like advice, you kind of touched a little bit of some of the things you, your mindset in high school, you had, you know, support system of people you would play with every day repetitively. But for someone that's in college right now, trying to make it to professional level, what are some recommendations you would give to that individual? And then part two of it, someone who just joined MLS or just played professionally, what is some advice you would share? Well, definitely, I would always say, well, first and foremost, make sure that you're having fun doing what you're doing. But two, understanding that there is no off season. So when that season ends, what are your plans for the next season? Set some goals for yourself to, to achieve so that, you, again, you have those tangible things that you can reach out and touch. Um, and then also get in the gym and make sure you're taking care of your body, whatever that may be, whether it's hitting the weights or hitting the road and running, making sure you're hitting your agilities and, 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 and for a college student, I would definitely say make sure you're taking care of the classroom. Um, yeah. Um, but someone who is just making it, um, make sure that, you know, don't don't see it as, oh, I made it, I can take my foot off the gas pedal. Mm -hmm. Now you got to start looking at how can I further develop my craft? How can I take my game to the next level? Uh, because it's going to require more fitness. It's going to require more commitment. You're going to be all over the country, so making sure you're taking care of your body, making sure you're eating right, and, and make sure you invest in yourself. Like if you if you look at the, the perennial players, right, like LeBron, you know he spends close to you know a million dollars taking care of his body, right? And that's where we see him being able to stay in the league 18, 19 years. But I'm not saying you go out and spend a million dollars on your body, but that, that level of commitment, yeah. um, taking care of your body, making sure you're doing the proper recovery, uh, making sure. You know, you give the proper rest as well, right? You don't want to overdo it. So you got to find a routine that works best for you that you're able to still to get the work in, but also rest and be ready to, to do it the next day. Because, uh, you know, the, the work doesn't just happen in the line. It's going to be the person who goes to the gym on their own and puts in that extra hour and puts in that extra technical training there to kind of help them to, to make it to the next level. Absolutely. I think that's a, a great advice across the board. Again, not only for the soccer, but any sports. Definitely have fun with it. If you're not going to have fun with it, you're not going to probably want to give it your all. And you're not going to put that extra time in. But then, you know, there's on and off the field. There's a lot of things you got to do. And a lot of folks that I've spoken to beforehand, they talk a lot about the business side as well. Uh, you can be great and all. Everyone's good. But understand, you know, when you're working with agent, make sure you're working with someone that's actually in it for you not just for themselves. And even if you don't get playing time or, you know, you're kind of bouncing around playing for different teams, like take that as a perception of that's a good way to just network, get your name out there. We talked about you going to even winter circles kind of come together. I definitely hear you on that. And I think those are great tips. Yeah. I, you, you touched on a good point too, right? If, if, a, if a guy isn't playing, right? I think the easiest thing to do is to, to point fingers at other people of why you're not playing and Mm -hmm. and or why you're not being included but I think you should also look within yourself and see what what am I not doing and what is that person that is playing doing that's getting them yeah. being able to play because um it, it you know you touched on that too about being you know that guy right at the high school level being that right. guy from college and then you get to the pros and it's like everybody is that guy so so right. they right? so you, you gotta humble yourself mm -hmm. you gotta stay the course and then you gotta also be ready to improve your craft in, in, in many different facets, right? You, you can't just be a one trick pony that's good at one thing. You, you need to right. be most of all those things and, and trying to find that competitive edge, like, you know, whether it's looking at film or, or being the most fittest guy, right? You got to find something that, that coaches can gravitate towards and be like, we need that person for X, Y, Z. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. No, I appreciate those insights. I think those are great ones. And again, this is kind of why I put this together, this platform. I think there's a lot of raw talents. I think growing up, we knew a bunch of people too, but sometimes you don't have the right resources. You might be around the wrong people, but um, just like these tidbits that you can share, you don't know how much it can help someone just get to where they need to be. To close it out, did, is there anything else you want to share? Not really, man. I just, I would also say too, you know, coming from Winchester, you, you hear a lot that, you know, it's an isolated city, you know, 
you know, I don't have the ability to make it. You know, there's right. several players that have been able to make it. And yeah. regardless of what level it is, what city you're in, what socioeconomic status you come from, who your parents are, none of that matters, man. And it's everybody has an opportunity to make it. And there are some guys that don't, and they can create an opportunity for themselves. But I, I would say to kids in Winchester, don't be discouraged because you're coming from a city that's isolated in the mountains. Mm-hmm. Um, it's still there's still a place for you out there, whether it is D1, D2, or D3. And I also say don't get fixated on being in those you know top tier teams because there there are other rosters that can be filled in second division, third division, or even any high school. So if, if you mm-hmm. have aspirations of playing at the next level, just don't be so fixed and one track minded to think that it's either that or bust. But right. because you, know, you could go to a school in the lower division and then be seen by another coach to transfer. So if there are opportunities out there for you to take it when none others are coming, why wouldn't you pursue that if you really want to play at that level? Absolutely. I think, uh, especially in this day and age, you know, social media is a big platform too. I think back when you played, you, people actually had to make trips down. They might read about you. But nowadays, we can just upload something on YouTube. You can just reach out to a coach. So like you said, you made a great point. It doesn't matter where you're from. Um, that's one thing about sports and food. It brings people together. It doesn't matter where you're from, what your background is, you can make it happen. And nowadays it's so, everything's so accessible. So it's just about you making that initiative. I would also say to the kids, be your, be your own cheerleader, right? If you're not getting the looks, put together your own, your own material and send out. Yep. In that sense, I would say, don't be humble. Toot your own horn. Because if, if, if you don't toot your own horn, then who else is going to toot your own horn? Right. So you got to be, you got to be your, 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 your best, be your own agent, you know, reach out to those coaches, write those letters. Yep. If, you, if you know somebody, go and reach out to them and, and, and ask them how it's done. You know, it doesn't always have to be the coach coming and finding you. You can help yep. make these coaches come and find you. Absolutely. No, I think that's a good point. Well, hey, Johnny, I appreciate those tips you shared. I think this is not even for sports, just anywhere in life. You know, hard work, persistency, building relationships, and just taking initiative amongst yourself will bring you far away but more importantly have fun with it i think that's a big takeaway that you really honed in on so again appreciate your time and i think this is something a lot of people can learn from so again thank you very much yeah man i appreciate you having me again i'm glad to be a part of it and i think what you're doing is a good thing for for kids not only for sport but for for that insight of of how how to be better and also if they want to make it to the next level maybe they can pull something from these things so i keep doing what you're doing man. i like this concept